Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome you all to Queen's free Speaking of Health lecture series. Tonight's lecture is called An Insider's Guide to the Emergency Department, What You Should Know. And we have such a great a, a great amount of, of speakers this evening. It's kind of exciting to me to have this many in the house from the emergency department. They're like rock stars to me. It's just incredible. I'm sorry. I'm just getting a little fan crazy right here. Uh, my name is Lisa Sakia. I'm with Corporate Communications at the Queen's Health Systems. And on behalf of Queen's, I'd like to welcome all of you this evening. And now it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce to you our speakers for this evening. Our first speaker, I'm going to introduce you. He is Dr. Rick Bruno, if you could stand. He is the Vice President for Patient Care here at the Queen's Health Systems. He attended medical school at Yale. He completed his residency in emergency medicine at NYU Bellevue Hospital. He then served as an attending physician at the King's Co County Hospital Emergency Department and the affiliated SUNY Downstate Medical Center in Brooklyn. He is a practicing emergency physician for more than 20 years. In his current role as VP for patient care, he provides administrative oversight for the health system's surgical, trauma, emergency medicine, obstetrics, and rehab programs, wears many hats. Dr. Bruno also serves as the State Department of Health EMS Medical Director for Oahu. I'd also like to introduce at this time Dr. Howie Klemmer. who is Queen's Chief of Emergency Medicine. His mother was a physician who cared for Hansen's disease patients in Hawaii. His father was a UH microbiologist. He graduated from Punahou, and he won state championships in wrestling and outrigger canoe paddling. In fact, he competed in and won two gold medals in canoe paddling at the World Championship Sprints which is an exhibition event for the 1984 Olympic Games in Los Angeles. He completed his undergraduate training and medical school at the University of Miami in Florida. He did his residency training at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, where he was elected chief resident during his residency. He was asked to work as an attending physician at Emory following the residency and he completed an administrative fellowship and earned an executive MBA at Emory. In 1998, he and his wife moved back to Hawaii to raise their family. He was elected Chief of Emergency Medicine at the Queen's Medical Center in 2012 and is presently serving his second term as Chief. This June will mark 20 years of working here at Queen's. He has two children who are now both attending the University of Colorado. Next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ajit Dubé. He is the Assistant Chief of Queen's Emergency Department and Medical Director of the Emergency Department at Queen's West Oahu. Dr. Dubé was born and raised in Edmonton, Canada. He studied at the University of Alberta in Canada. He obtained his medical degree at St. George's University School of Medicine completed his residency training at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. He has had the good fortune, he says, of working in Brooklyn, Detroit, and Cincinnati before hanging up his hockey skates and before getting wise, as he put it, and moving to Hawaii in 2015. Now he spends most of his free time with his family chasing around their three kids and trying to learn how to surf. He also feels very fortunate to help lead a team of amazing people to advance high quality, efficient care for our patients in the emergency department. And I'd also like to introduce to you Greg Payne, who is a nurse manager of the emergency department. <laughs> Greg is from Melbourne, Australia, and moved to the islands in 2004. He received his Bachelor's of Science degree in nursing from the University of Hawaii, Manoa. He has worked at Queen since 2008 and has been the nurse manager of the emergency department since 2015. He said when he was in nursing school, the moment he picked up a stethoscope, 
That's when he knew he wanted to be an emergency department nurse. And he didn't mention this, but I wanted to bring it up. Uh, Queens supports the National Guard and reserve personnel by allowing them to take the time off from work to train and also when they do deployments. Um, but what's important is also the managers of the department who have to find the coverage for when they leave. And so there's this Department of Defense program that honors those particular individual supervisors. And last year, Greg was recognized as a patriotic employer. And the employee and guard member who uh, works in our ED wrote, Greg is very supportive of our efforts to support our community, our state, our nation in allowing us time off without difficulty to serve our country, train and educate our members and be prepared. He and the ED leadership team work with us and staff to find the coverage needed when we are gone without a hitch. And then I'd like to, last but not least, introduce you to Dr. Daniel Danny Cheng. He is the Assistant Chief in Emergency Medicine and Medical Director of the Emergency Department at Queen's Punchbowl. He is also the Medical Director of the Queen's Care Coalition. He was born and raised on Oahu. I forgot, what school did you graduate? We got to know this. Punahou. Punahou, okay. Clever! <laughs> With Dr. Clever. He, is, uh, he received his Bachelor's of Science with a specialization in neuroscience from the University of California, Irvine. He got his Master's in Public Health in Epidemiology from the University of California, Los Angeles. After earning his MD at the University of Hawaii, John A. Burns School of Medicine, he completed his residency at the Los Angeles County and University of Southern California Hospital, where he held the position of Chief Resident of Education. He serves currently as the Assistant Chief of Emergency Medicine, which I said. He is fluent in Mandarin. And this thing, I, I just wanted to point it out, in 2013, you might want to check it out or Netflix it, there was a documentary called Code Black, and he was featured in it. And that documentary showed, uh, I believe it was the Los Angeles County Hospital, which was one of the the busiest, most chaotic hospitals, and he's a young guy doing it, and just, it was amazing to see. It's called Cold Black, and it won multiple awards in these film festivals, so you might want to check it out. And so, let's start off with Dr. Rick Bruno. So, uh, we're going to break this talk up into um, five sections on what it's like to come to the emergency department, and try to fill a little bit on, on what we do, so both from a patient's point of view, what should you expect, uh, what can you do to prepare to come to the emergency department, and then also just a little bit of color on what our day-to-day -day is like and a little bit of history of, of emergency medicine as we go through. So I'm going to start, I'm going to cover um, mostly about the pre-hospital and uh, who should go to the emergency department and just give you a little bit of an overview of EMS in the state. We have a, a very good EMS system. It's an interesting EMS system from a planning point of view because it's a state centralized system where most EMS systems are actually uh, county based or metropolitan based. And I won't get into too much details, but it's uh, worth knowing a little bit about. And then uh, how he's going to talk about uh, the Queen's Emergency Department, which we're very proud of, and a little history of emergency medicine and how emergency medicine came uh, into the House of Medicine. It's one of the youngest specialties. And then we'll talk about our new campus, the West Emergency Department, and uh, cover some common questions people have about the ED. And then uh, Greg is going to walk us through actually the flow, what to expect physically when you get to the emergency department. And then uh, Danny's going to talk about a program that uh, he is. Uh, spearheading with a group of uh, great folks who work in our emergency department looking at uh, how do we care uh, for the homeless and um, some of the transitions back to the community. So uh, when should one go to the emergency department? Um, it's a good question. It's something my mom called me. Uh, my mom lives in rural Wisconsin and she had a bloody nose and her question was should I go to the emergency department? Um, 
And the probably the best way to think about it is you should go to the emergency department if a reasonable person perceives that they have an emergency. And you'll see how he's going to talk a little bit about some of the federal regulations covering uh, emergency medicine and the uh, uh, word that we use, it's the prudent layperson. What would a uh, normal person do in that situation? And so for my mom with a bloody nose at 2 o'clock in the morning in rural Wisconsin, um, it's actually the only place she could go. So in that case, it's probably reasonable to go to the emergency department. Um, some other uh, reasons one would go is if you have a condition that you think will get worse over the next two to three days. Um, one of the things that you might do is speak with your physician about your specific medical condition, specifically if you have a chronic medical condition, and come up with a plan for you individually. What should you do off hours? Uh, is it Do you reach out to that provider? Do you go to the emergency department if certain um, uh, thresholds are met? Uh, so it's a very individualized question on when should one go to the emergency department. How should I get to the emergency department? This is actually a, a good question on when should you call uh, 911. Uh, I queried my friends uh, at city and county on uh, when should one uh, dial 911. And it probably the best thing is if you perceive you have an emergency or you see someone who you believe has an emergency, starting with a 911 call is not unreasonable if you believe that uh, the condition is a imminent threat to uh, either life, limb, um, or you're physically unable to get to the emergency department any other way uh, is, is reasonable sometimes. Uh, what should I expect when I call? Um, when you call 911, I actually had dispatch send me over the questions that they're going to ask you. The first question when you dial in 911 operator, you're actually dialing into uh, police and they're going to put you, uh, when you ask, uh, is this an emergency or not, and route you either to police, fire, or an ambulance. And the questions when you get routed to the uh, EMS dispatch, the first question is going to be, what's the address of the emergency? And the reason that seems kind of a strange question, why would you lead with what's the address, is they need to know where to send the ambulance. All the rest of the questions, once they have the address, they will dispatch an ambulance. Everything else is to try to figure out um, what level of response they'll get. So the first question you're going to get is what's the address of the emergency? The next one is what phone call, what phone are you calling from? The reason they ask that is if you become, if they, you get disconnected and they need to call back so they don't lose the call. And then they're going to ask you, tell me exactly what happened. So they want in layman's term what's going on. Um, the other question if you're calling for someone else is are you with the patient now? If you are, they're going to ask you probably to stay with the patient and you can be an advocate for getting uh, timely care to that patient. They're going to ask the patient's age, the patient's gender. They're going to ask you, and this is uh, now getting into what type of ambulance is going to respond, is is the patient awake? Is the patient breathing? We don't do um, dispatch CPR here. It's something that we've talked about. But knowing that how sick is the patient is going to uh, gauge what tier of response are you going to Are you going to get uh, a 911 lights and siren? Are you going to get a co-response with police? Uh, or are you going to get uh, what we call a cold call? There are certain conditions, if met, you're not going to get a lights and sirens ambulance coming. So again, when they ask you what's going on, it's important because that's helping us tier our resources in the uh, field. Will I be charged for the EMS uh, visit? And so the uh, EMS is uh, overseen by the state. The state's in charge of all the billing for EMS. You will get a bill uh, for a 911 ambulance. Uh, roughly, it's about thirteen to sixteen hundred dollars. So yes, you will be charged uh, if you have insurance or a government insurance program. Most of the time, they pick up uh, most of that. Uh, cost, but so calling an ambulance and getting an ambulance, you will receive a bill uh, from the ambulance company. Uh, always call 911. When should you call? If you think you're having a heart attack, if you think you're having a stroke, if there's an injury where the bleeding can't be controlled, this is an objective sign on when you should call 911. I'm going to talk a little bit about our EMS system. Um, I serve as the EMS medical director for Oahu. Uh, what we do is we uh, you come up with the rules for uh, where an ambulance goes, the medications on an ambulance, training of the paramedics. Um, we have a very special EMS system uh, in the state. All of our providers in the 911 system are at the highest level of care. They act as paramedics. 
They have the ability to provide advanced life-saving techniques. Where I trained in New York City, most of the ambulance were actually BLS rigs. Uh, they were at a basic level of care. The medics could do CPR, they could do some basic interventions, uh, but not at the level that we have here in Hawaii. One of the reasons that we have an all ALS fleet in Hawaii is uh, outside of Honolulu, we're a rural state. And so bringing that highest level of care to patients' homes uh, in rural communities is, is very important. Another thing uh, interesting about our EMS system is each county has uh, the ability to determine of who will be the EMS provider in Oahu. It's uh, through the city government. It's uh, subcontracted from the state, and that's why we usually call it city and county. Those, uh, so it's basically the city runs the EMS system subcontracted from the state. In Hawaii County, they uh, go through the fire department, and then Maui and Kauai actually subcontract to AMR, which is a large uh, national EMS um, company. And so each uh, county has the ability to determine who's going to run their EMS system. And it's just interesting, across our counties, we have essentially the three different ways you can run an EMS system. And again, what makes us so special is we have to respond, we have to have a system that accounts for urban Honolulu, but also rural spots in Oahu, such as Kahuku or Laie, and then the neighbor islands. This is just a quick, so what, are kind of, what kind of calls do we get in EMS? Um, the most common uh, outside of the, when you see sick person, no other appropriate choice, that's just a hodgepodge that they couldn't figure out, uh, or the person who put the data in uh, wasn't clear what the complaint is. But after that, most common uh, call is difficulty breathing. After that, it's uh, injuries. You'll see chest pain, trauma, abdominal pain, all very common cause uh, to EMS. And this, uh, I think this data is from 2016, just what are, were all the calls uh, that came in. This is a picture of where our ambulances in uh, Oahu. At any given time, we have about 19 ambulances on the road, uh, concentrated in the urban center, but you can see uh, rural places like Kahuku, Wailua, out in the west in Waianae all have ambulance coverage. We have pretty good geographic coverages. One of our challenges, though, is if you have a cardiac arrest in Kahuku and you have to come to town, you can see a very wide area of geography is left uncovered. There's a whole system for backfilling, but it's one of the challenges in our EMS system of uh, how do you cover a large geographic area where uh, basically uh, not very many people live. Uh, other things interesting about our system is interfacility transfers. Uh, at Queens, we receive about 800 calls a month requesting uh, interfacility transfers from other hospitals. Uh, we receive thousands of transfers uh, from the neighbor islands each month, I mean each year. Most of those come by fixed wing um, air aircraft. We do more interfacility fixed wing transports than any other state in the nation. The only uh, state that competes with us is Alaska. They have similar geography issues that we have. So interfacility transfers into Queens is a very important part of our healthcare system. So if you're on the neighbor islands, one of the ways you may get to the emergency department is either from a, a fixed wing aircraft or a helicopter. Uh, just to give you some uh, background on what kind of cases do we get in the, at Queens. Uh, we get a fair number of tertiary care transfers for cath labs. Uh, the neighbor islands outside of Maui don't have the ability to uh, take someone to a cardiac cath lab because they don't exist. Uh, we have a hub and spoke model for neuro care in uh, Hawaii where if you have a stroke on the big island and you show up in the Hilo emergency department, one of the physicians taking care of you will actually be sitting in our ICU. Uh, those patients are then flown to Queens for care. Last year, we had over 1,000 transfers for acute cardiac and stroke uh, care from the neighbor islands. Uh, both gra uh, ground and air play very important roles uh, in uh, keeping our system together. Aeromedical transport, I spoke about it, but this is just a picture of who are the different people who uh, supply aeromedical transport to the emergency department. Mostly we do fixed wings through two private companies uh, out of the uh, neighbor island airports. We do fly rotor from Kona. Uh, and then Maui Sheriff's Department has a helicopter that for the rural areas of Maui County and Molokai that they have the ability to fly either back to Maui uh, or Oahu. I put a Coast Guard in the middle. This is something that you might not be aware of, but our backup in the state for medical emergency for transports are, uh, is actually the Coast Guard. Part of their mission uh, for search and rescue is supplying uh, support for us. Uh, typical cases we have is bariatric cases from the neighbor islands. Um, 
And there was, for those of you who remember, there, this is going back uh, 15 years where a couple of air ambulance crashes, and for a time all aircraft in the state was uh, grounded, so we were 100% relied on the Coast Guard to uh, transport patient between the islands. So I add this on just kind of an interesting wrinkle on uh, how emergency medical care is supplied in the state. What's it like to come to the emergency department? At this point, I'm going to turn it over to Howie Clammer to talk a little bit more about once you arrive, whether by foot, by ambulance, or by air, uh, what to expect. Thanks, Rick, and thank you, uh, Lisa, for this opportunity to come to this wonderful lecture series for to allow the emergency department uh, people to have a chance to sort of reach out to the public, answer your questions, and help you understand what what we do and what we're all about. Um, so my my goal is to cover a bit about Queen's Punchbowl, which is the major tertiary care center for the state and for the Pacific Rim, and talk a bit about what um, has happened over the century about emergency medicine. How did it evolve? And, uh, and then we'll turn over to Ajit Dubey to talk more about Queens West Oahu, our newest uh, uh, hospital, which is part of the medical center called Queens Medical Center. We have two campuses, West Oahu and Punchbowl. So Punchbowl, we see about 65,000 patients a year. It's the busiest emergency department in the state. We've sort of had a, a leveling off of the census because of uh, capacity, and um, we receive about 16,000 ambulances a year. Um, that's about 25% of our patients on average. We are the level one trauma center, the uh, STEMI center for acute heart attacks, or MIs. We're the comprehensive stroke center for the state. We also are the organ transplant center and the main hospital for emergency care for psychiatric patients as well. So let's dive in a brief history of emergency medicine back in the day when, when they had, uh, you know, they, I mean, even in the battlefields of civil war, right, there was emergency services with horses and chariots. But over the past hundred years or so, we've seen really a big change in three things, facilities, how the pre-hospital care is done and, and those vehicles used for transport, and a lot of the change that occurred since World War II, which was the age of industrialization for a lot of what we've seen in healthcare. So back in the day, there were a lot of house calls. We had treatment rooms at some facilities, but mostly untrained or minimally trained staff. Ambulances were just whatever the vehicle you could find, often hearses and police wagons, and also they had minimally trained uh, emergency medical personnel. And then in World War II, we saw the war machine really ramp up, and we saw a lot of casualties and sort of the industrialized model used to mass produce vehicles that were all the same size, all the same dimensions with all the same purposes and functions and processes that really helped to standardize care and was a big step forward in what we see now in, in modern medicine. And of course they had staff that were properly trained. So emergency medicine was the 23rd specialty back in um, 1976. There's 26 specialties total for um, what we use in the United States. Other countries have different specialties that they designate, but for the U.S. there's 26, we're the 23rd. The American College of Emergency Physicians, which is the main governing body, began in 1968, and the first residency training program started in the 1970s. And they were, one of them was USC, where Danny attended, another one was University of Cincinnati, and then the Medical College of Pennsylvania. Those are the first three in the country. Today, there's over 200 residency programs. It's one of the most competitive programs to get into as a medical specialty. It's highly in demand, and um, we pride ourselves on attracting really bright medical students to go into med emergency medicine. There's well over 40,000 emergency phys physicians practicing today. So in 1990, there was a really big uh, piece of legislation that occurred, and it was called the Patient's Bill of Rights. And it was the basic standard we call the prudent layperson standard. And Rick uh, Bruno spoke briefly about that, and that really is the key landmark decision that allows patients access to emergencies and not have their insurance companies say, no, we're not paying for that. And so what the standard is, is if you think you're having an emergency, then you, 
in your mind are, and you should go to the ER. You should not not have to worry about getting that covered by your health plan. And so you're not expected to know if that chest pain you're having is a heart attack or just indigestion. That's up to the, the team of uh, nurses and doctors and others involved to help figure out when you get there. So this was a landmark decision. Um, you have a right as a patient to seek emergency care. And um, insurance companies can't retrospectively block or deny payment. So it, it was designed to avoid barriers to access because overall the health system makes or loses less money, right? It's co less costly if people get care for the right reason at the right time and the right, in the right way and not have that delayed or denied. So you don't want to have barriers to get the care. That's, uh, that was the, 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 the reason for the initiative and it's worked well. But it got a little bit too ahead of itself, and, and so we'll see more of what happened. But before we get there, in 1986, this law occurred. Does anybody know what EMTALA is? How many people have heard of EMTALA? Few. Yeah, the doctors, of course, have. <laughs> um, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Active Labor Act. And this was a huge piece of legislation because what this does is say that not only does a patient have a right to come to the ER, but the ER has to see them regardless of their ability to pay. And that's a good thing when you think about it because you don't want to have somebody with a bad emergency denied care, but it also leaves open the door so that the hospital is requ required to at least provide a medical screening examination and to their fullest extent evaluate the patient regardless of the patient's ability to pay. And we'll see how that sometimes has created a situation where because of lack of alternatives to health care, emergency departments can become crowded with people that just are using it for an access point rather than for real emergencies. So what's happened is there, this is kind of a schematic, hopefully you can see that, um, that shows how patients access the health care system and how they get to the hospital, which is on the right-hand side. So the patient on the top left can either get self-care, which is now easier than ever with the Internet and the age of information we're in, they can go to their PCP, which is really the preferred method, but sometimes PCPs aren't available for unscheduled health care. That's what ERs do best, is it's, it's health care that's unscheduled. That's what it's, it's an emergency or an accident that occurs, and your PCP may not be able to accommodate you. So there's urgent care centers and now retail clinics, and those serve a good purpose too, and they have a, a nice niche, especially if you kind of know what's wrong with yourself. But if you're having chest pain or abdominal pain or it could be something bad, that may not be your best choice um, unless you know what it is. Uh, so then you have the emergency department. In the old days, you used to be able to go from your PCP's office through their care right into the hospital through that route direct admission. More or less, that's been re removed in the past decade or so because of the way that things have her occurred in um, in healthcare system, and it's a kind of a whole other conversation, but for the most part, the ER has become the portal into the hospital. And why that's important is because if you think about it from a cost perspective, emergency department visits only account for about 3% of the total healthcare costs in the country. Just 3%, maybe 5% at the most. Whereas hospital care accounts fully for at least a third of all healthcare dollars spent. And that includes ambulances, um, nursing homes, medications, fees for doctors, nurses, everything else. So fully a third of all the costs are in the hospital. And the hospitals can be quite expensive. So if you don't need to stay in the hospital, then it's important to get people to the right place for the right care. So that's partly how it's become complicated. What we saw, and these are good studies that are run, but it, the general trend is that fewer people go from doctor's offices into the hospitals and more go through the ED for better or worse. And we're trying to kind of reverse some of that with modern triple aim and, uh, and population health uh, changes that are occurring to get people back to their PCPs. But what happened is the PCP said, I don't know how to do this workup in a, or I can't do this workup in a rapid, timely fashion. People are comfortable getting just in time. They want to know everything now. They can't get an MRI, they can't get a CAT scan, they can't get all those labs, they can't get you to see that specialist, so they say go to the ER, they'll take care of it, and that's what's happened. 
So today, EDs manage well over 70% of all healthcare encounters acutely. That's for acute healthcare. They, they manage over well over 50% of all hospital admissions. At Punchbowl here, it's about 60% of all the hospital admissions come through the ER because we do have a big operating room and a very wonderful group of talented surgeons, and many of those patients have to be admitted after surgery. But for instance, at West, a younger community-based hospital, 95% of those admissions, like a typical community hospital, come through the ER. And then ERs manage well over 70% of all Medicare admissions to hospitals. So here's Queen's Emergency Department experience. You can see punch bowl in blue, and our growth rate over the past 15 years has been about 3 to 5% per year growth, some years more, some years less. But recently, since West opened in the green there, you see how it's rapidly or significantly stopped growing. We basically hit a point of capacity at Punch Bowl. But West continues to grow, and West has grown quite significantly. The number at the top is overall growth for the Queens Medical Center between the two campuses. West is growing about 8 to 10 percent a year, even to this day, and it's the second busiest hospital emergency department in the state. So how long do you, do I wait? This was the question I got about what we thought might be helpful. It, it depends, right? If you, if you have a paper cut, you might wait a while if you just got a big car accident and three trauma victims and the doctors and nurses tied up with those patients, or you might just get seen right away. We've utilized new processes to help move patients to the right place for the right care more effectively and efficiently so we can get everybody seen more quickly, and that's our goal. So the goal is to hopefully get you to see a doctor quickly to determine what needs to be done to get your care. Um, so yeah, we utilize a triage system, and triage is really the French word for sorting. So we sort patients appropriately based on their need. And um, yes, at times there's boarding. Boarding means that the patient that needs to go to the hospital, that needs to stay in the hospital at admission, is stuck sitting in the ER waiting for a bed upstairs to become available. <clears throat> so here's a graphic from 2015 uh, to, th to December 16. This is our second uh, point of what we call STAR, which was our acronym for Super Triage and REACT. So these are the patients that come in by um, private vehicle or on foot and don't come in by ambulance. They're ambulatory patients that need to get care. They may have a cough, chest pain, abdominal pain, vomiting, but they're not coming in by an ambulance, and there may be, most of them can go home after their evaluation, so their wait times were significantly improved through the work of people like Dr. DeBay and Dr. Chang and Greg, um, figuring out how can we work more efficiently as a team. So our median times are well below the benchmark. At Punchbowl, we've remained well under 20 minutes on how long it takes you to get from the time you arrive to the time you see a doctor, and that's our goal. And then this is a longer graph over the, uh, the past uh, five years, and it shows that most recent uh, STAR 2.0 and the previous version STAR and what happened with our discharge patient length of stay. So about 80% of our patients that come into Punchbowl are discharged. 20% need to stay in the hospital. That's a typical percentage for an adult acute care facility. Um, for community hospitals, it's usually less need, need to be admitted, about 10 to 15 percent. And um, <clears throat> so here you see the length of stay for discharge patients went down significantly from over 220 minutes down to less than 150, uh, 155 minutes. So it's a significant improvement over the last five years, and that's part of our goal. That's the part we own and control is what happens in the ER for patients that can go home. For patients that have to stay in the hospital, it all depends on hospital census and bed availability. So, I don't know if you can read this, but here's our challenge, hospital crowding. That's the world we live in. And these two guys are sitting in a chair and they're saying, we're not your visitors, we're just waiting for your bed. <laughs> and that's unfortunately sometimes how it gets because Queens is the place where we take care of the sickest of the sick in the state and we want to be able to sort patients appropriately, so we're having beds available for those that really need them. 
So who will take care of me? Well, you're going to see a doctor, most likely, or there will at least be a doctor there at all times. If you have a minor injury, like a sprained ankle, you may see a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant. And sometimes you may see them helping you in the main department, too. Even if you're having a stroke or a heart attack, you may see nurse practitioners or physician's assistants working alongside of doctors to help in the team. And there's, of course, a group of people that are involved. Here's three of our doctors. Dr. Let's see, Afshari, Dr. Kikuhara, and Dr. Schneider. Yes, they're all young, wonderful doctors that have joined our team in the last probably four years, five years. And uh, the ED takes the teamwork. It really does. And we are very proud to be the tertiary care center. If you come in with a stroke, a heart attack, a major trauma, we have a team of people ready and assembled to take care of you when you arrive. And that's our goal. So it, it really requires a coordinated care effort and teamwork. So we've got... Of course, the doctors you met, met, we mentioned earlier, the nurses, you know, the, what would we do without all our, our wonderful, great nurses? The emergency medical technicians, EMTs, and um, they're techs that do many things. They'll do EKGs, they'll help uh, people with bathing, they'll uh, do uh, system nursing care, you name it. They're really uh, skilled at many different things. We have phlebotomists, x-ray technicians, CT technicians, MRI technicians, we have registrars. To make sure we got the right information for you, phone numbers, address, contact info, unit secretaries that answer the phone. We don't give phone advice. That's an important one to know. We can't give advice over the phone. We can just tell you, come on in if you're worried, if you think it's an emergency. Uh, we have pharmacists in the ER at both campuses. We have social workers 24-7. We have case managers to help with follow-up appointments and continuity care. Of course, we have housekeepers and we have chaplains. Okay, that's it for me, and we have Dr. Dubay. Hi, so my name again is uh, Dr. Ajit Dubey, and uh, the Assistant Chief of Emergency Medicine and Medical Director at Queens West. Um, I'd like to start out by saying thank you for everyone for attending and giving us this opportunity to try to hopefully make you feel more comfortable with an ER visit. Um, and also thank you, I heard that traffic was pretty bad, so thanks for braving the traffic. Um, <clears throat> so again, I work at Queens West Emergency Department and uh, Queens West opened in 2014, so about four years now. So it's a 80 bed hospital um, in the community for uh, 10 beds for the ICU and four operating rooms. Um, I live myself out in the west side in Eva Beach. Um, myself, my wife, uh, three kids, we've been there for three years now. Um, in these past three years, we've seen the west side grow um, probably as fast as our kids are growing. It's a pretty impressive rate of growth out there. Um, we've witnessed barren plots of land pop up into new malls, new theaters, lots of new houses, and lots of new families. It's, um, it's an exciting area to live in and exciting to see the growth. And um, it's great to be part of Queens that grows with this community. Um, <clears throat> one, some of the things that we've added over the past four years, we have a, a wound care center, a pediatric after hours clinic, pulmonology, sleep studies, um, sleep studies lab, and then we're always continuing to add further things as, as we support our community and the growth in West Oahu. So as I said, we opened up in uh, four years ago, and uh, it's, it's been a great four years. We're constantly growing and uh, constantly looking for new ways to support our community and grow with our community. Last year, Queens West Oahu ED, we saw more than 57,000 patients, averaging about 170 patients per day, with a growth rate, as uh, Dr. Clemmer mentioned, of about 10%. Um, <clears throat> when we opened with the uh, impre with the kind of the estimation that we'd see about 120 patients per day. So that was what the hospital was built for. So 170 patients per day is definitely providing a significant challenge. Um, <clears throat> and with the current growth rate of 10% uh, versus punch bowls, na nationwide emergency departments are growing at about 2%. Uh, punch bowl itself is growing about 2% as well. Um, with our current growth rate of 10%, I'm thinking probably two, three years before we're seeing as much or if not, being the busiest emergency department in Hawaii. So 
So our vision for Queens West Oahu um, is growth, managing that growth, growing with our community, supporting the community, um, trying to anticipate the community's needs, such as increasing specialist coverage, um, labor and delivery, um, cardiac cath labs, um, growth and expanding in our inpatient beds. Um, right now we have, again, 80 inpatient beds, so we're trying to, and those beds are pretty much, uh, I think 95% of the time, all occupied. So trying to get more inpatient beds for our community and uh, more ER beds for our community. Um, continuing to provide our high quality care and avoiding traffic. So trying to keep our community and the west side instead of traveling all the way down to Punch Bowl. How can I prepare for uh, my visit? So things you can do to make your ER visit go smoother is to try to bring your identification, your insurance card. This will help register you appropriately. Bring your cell phone um, to help kind of communicate with family members and keep you busy during your ER stay. Bring your family or friends, which will help advocate for you in a time where you may feel a lot of pain and feel very sick. Um, make sure you know your name. Try to have a primary care provider um, and know the name of your primary care provider. Um, something that would be great that we would all appreciate in the emergency department is if you have a list, if you, especially if you have a complicated list of uh, your medications, your allergies, past medical history, and past surgical history. Having this, like a small list, put in your wallet, your purse, or your cell phone. That way, if an event occurs, you have this information ready for us, ready to go for us. It will help us take care of you more effectively. Um, if you have an advanced directive, or a POLST, which is a physician order for life-sustaining treatment, um, to help guide us if you have a terminal illness of how you want your end-of-life goals to be. Um, so we, we understand that the emergency department itself can be kind of an overwhelming, busy, chaotic appearing place, but we do want everyone to understand that it's highly organized, highly structured, and regardless of what your, what your visit is for, we're ready to take care of you, and we look forward to taking care of you. Uh, next up is uh, Gregory Payne, who's gonna talk about more what to expect when you arrive. Welcome everyone. If you're having a little trouble or difficulty understanding me, uh, I apologize. Having an accent sometimes a little, uh, puts a little barrier up. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight um, and also um, thank you all for the opportunity to shed a little light in what we do. Um, my job tonight is to talk about what happens when you walk in and kind of do a walk through with you, um, what you expect as you come through the department. So there's um, many, many ways in which, uh, or reasons for which you come to the emergency department, um, but there's really two main ways to get here, and, and they've already been touched on them. One's with our emergency services, and the other one is you get here by yourself. Um, if you come in with EMS, uh, you'll probably roll in straight into the department, and you'll be moved directly to uh, a patient care area. Um, it could look like this. This is our main trauma bay. You can see uh, it's quite a large room. Um, there's a curtain on one side. There's actually curtains on both sides. If we needed to open the bay up even more, we can. Um, it gives us the opportunity to have a team um, of up to a dozen or more people in the room at a time uh, when necessary. Uh, and it means that we can provide uh, the best care with most of our equipment already uh, on site uh, pretty much instantaneously. So this is often the room someone will uh, be brought into if they've uh, had the unfortunate um, uh, car accident um, or um, maybe even if you've had a heart attack. But it could also end up in here um, if you've got a cut on your wrist and it needs to be stitched up. So if we wheel you into the room, this room, don't automatically get worried about it. Unfortunately, um, as Dr. Clemmer touched upon, sometimes we get really, really full in the department. Um, the natural flow of the day tends to be mid to late afternoon. Uh, we, do, we do get busier at that time. Uh, and we've had to make best use of every single space that we have. Uh, so this is, the, this is the area that you could end up in if every single room is filled. Um, it's a hallway space and 
We only like to use it um, when we have to, but you can see we have a cardiac monitor there, we have the, a call light. Um, you get the same nurses who work in the trauma rooms also work uh, in an area where they'll look after someone in the hallway, the same doctors, um, the same phlebotomists. Basically, you get the same care. Um, unfortunately, the space is a little bit more limited, um, but we would put you in this space because we didn't think we needed to get all of the resources together uh, straight away. If you are coming in uh, as what we call a walk-in, uh, although that's not always the case, um, you come in through our security area um, and you'll meet with one of our registrars, we'll take some vital signs. Uh, and then you'll be moved over to our arrival nurse. Um, the arrival nurse will try and work out, at a quick look, two or three minutes, how sick you are. Um, so they'll, they'll make that, they'll make that um, call um, and They'll sort of, in our system again, they'll triage you and they'll, they'll tag you to go to our main area, which is the trauma room or one of the other rooms or, or maybe a hallway space. And that's sort of the traditional model. Um, the problem with that is as soon as every single one of those spaces is taken up, and that does happen to us, um, then there's nowhere to put the next patient. And so um, several years ago, and Dr. Clemmer touched on it, we came up with the um, STAR model, Super Triage and React which is a model that um, keeps patients moving through who don't actually need to be laying down in a bed. Um, uh, you could still be relatively quite sick, but um, you know, you're able to sit in a chair or wheelchair uh, or a reclining seat um, that we have. Uh, and so you'll get seen uh, quickly and we're, we're very, very proud of the fact that we, we see most patients within 20 minutes or less. Um, by the doctor, and the doctor and a nurse will see you and they'll make a plan of care. Um, that, that will happen in a, in a smaller space, an intake room, and we'll move you through to um, next to a procedure room, um, and you can actually see it here in the bottom corner. Um, and it's a room where we might be able to, if we need to, we can draw some blood, um, send some tests onwards. Um, those tests usually take half an hour to an hour to come back, um, the results. Um, but we can also do point of care testing for certain labs um, and we can get those results in um, as little as two to ten minutes. Um, and that can tell us whether, um, uh, for example, your, an enzyme has been released um, from your heart because it's under stress um, and you might be having a heart attack. So um, even in this area, we can, we can test for um, many of the most uh, dangerous um, situations. Um, after we've gotten you through uh, the procedure area, um, we'll be looking at, quite often people will come in and they'll want to know what's going on inside. So we'll, we might take an x-ray, um, we might get you over to um, a CT scan. Um, these tests take uh, a little while because they need to be read um, by one of our physicians or by um, a specialist and they'll let us know what's going on. So sometimes an x-ray might take 30 minutes, um, a CAT scan might take us an hour, hour and a half to, to um, get to the bottom of what's going on. Um, and if, if um, you're relatively comfortable and able to sit up, you might then be placed in a chair and we'll, we'll let you know what's going on and how long it will take, but usually it'll be, you know, it might be an hour, We'll let you know um, uh, what the results are as soon as they come through. So there's the two, there's the two different pathways now that we have, and, and by doing this, um, it's really eliminated uh, those really long waits. Um, we feel that uh, the safety of our patients is improved out of sight because um, getting to see the doctor quickly uh, is the is the um, absolute best best method. Uh, and that's what we're able to do now. So um, Dr. Clem has already touched on the team, uh, but as you can see, uh, we've got a, a large range of nurses, techs, um, doctors, um, mid-level providers, um, unit secretaries and others who do everything, um, do everything for us. So what, what our role and what we try and do is we try and uh, help you understand what's going on, um, treat whatever issues, whether it's bleeding or pain, as quickly as we can. Um, and then um, our doctors will make a plan with you about um, whether the best thing for you is to come into the hospital or, it, or maybe to be able to go home. So that's just a, a brief view of what it looks like to walk through our department. Um, there'll certainly be a chance for a few questions later on that anyone has. But right now, um, Dr. Cheng is going to come up and talk a little bit about um, 
the program that he's helped to put in place. Thanks, Dan. Thank you again for everyone to come uh, make it on a Wednesday uh, to hear a little bit about what we're doing here at the ER. So um, just before I jump into this uh, slide deck, just wanted to kind of preface it. Dr. Clemmer mentioned a little bit about modern emergency medicine and to kind of put a framework of how this kind of makes sense and where we are. There's a couple of just statistics. So we are the highest per capita homeless uh, in the state, in the country, right? So our state has the most homeless individuals per individual uh, in Hawaii uh, in the country. And that's been since 2014. That's when Governor Ige declared a state of emergency. Uh, you know, modern medicine as we know it, as we know it, really kind of came about in the early 1900s. And um, really before that, if we could kind of think back 19th century, so the 1800s, even up to then, uh, the churches uh, really represented a place of sanctuary, 24 hours for individuals that were disenfranchised. Uh, this hospital is based upon a mission, um, and that's from Queen Emma, who was actually pretty, pretty deeply religious. Um, but she saw the need, and this is kind of interesting, around the time of 1800s, of there is an evolution, and she saw medicine as being, I think, the future of, of where people who are disenfranchised can be helped. Um, emergency departments such as ourselves, we consider ourselves sometimes a, what's called a county hospital, but we are the major tertiary medical center. We, we do everything. We, when, when it's the worst of the worst, everything comes to us. We have the best physicians. And, and that also, we also provide uh, open doors 24 hours for any uh, individual coming in, and that also means the disenfranchised. So one thing that we kind of focused in on here at Queens a couple years ago is that we realized that we take care of uh, a large portion of the homeless population here in Hawaii. Highest, again, homeless per capita. We actually take care of about roughly 70% of all homeless individuals uh, on Oahu. Uh, as a whole, the Queens system actually takes care of about 30% of all the acute health care counters. Um, but disproportionately, we take care of more, almost double of that for our homeless individuals. And when we dig a little deeper, we find out that this top kind of 10% actually utilize a lot of the cost. So there was a lot of reasons to really spend a lot of time understanding how are we failing this group. Uh, we see these individuals in Chinatown in chairs limping across. Some of them have significant mental illness that are clearly uh, preventing them from accessing care. But it, the, the, the complexity of it was deep. And we approached our executive leadership and we said that as a mission and, and, as, a, and as the kind of beacon of care for these individuals, we needed to do a better job of coordinating their care and really kind of stepping forward. And that was the genesis of what's now called the Queen's Care Coalition. This is a graph 2013 through 2016 that shows the amount of homeless ER encounters uh, statewide. In the blue is the Queen's Medical Center and orange is everyone else. And what we saw also with the what's called a point in time count that's run by the governor's office of the, uh, the homeless um, uh, coalition is that when you do the point in time uh, evaluation, it was increasing by 4% and that was the same percentage of volume that we were seeing increased here at the Queen's Medical Center. Uh, this graph, it's a, I apologize, it's a little dense, but this is, again, just to graphically represent the volume, and it helps us to understand kind of what we are grappling with here at the Queen's Medical Center. Uh, in blue is the amount of homeless care provided, the Queen's Medical Center here at Punchbowl, and then the Queen's Medical Center West Oahu, designated QMCWO. That percentage, if you add that up, is close to about 70%, the green being the non-homeless percentage. Uh, for clarity, PM is polymomy. So, you know, how did we get here? Uh, for so those of those who are not in the healthcare field, there are, there are certain things that we understand. Obviously, uh, the cost of living, right, to, to rent a shack uh, down in Honolulu can, can be upwards of about $1,500. Um, Seventy percent of our highest utilizers here are, are homeless. Um, we have methamphetamine, uh, an addiction and a, a real ice age is what was kind of dubbed by HPR, 
uh, Noni Tanigawa. And, and the idea is that really methamphetamines in the nation started in Hawaii and it's still been ravaging our community. We actually have uh, as an absolute number, so even as an absolute number, even though we're roughly about the 28th to 29th most populated state in the union, we actually have the most related admissions due to methamphetamine uh, than any other state. Um, so it's just a very dubious type of designation, and it's actually, I think, led and fueled uh, where we are now today uh, in terms of highest uh, homeless per capita. This is just a geographical representation of some of the diagnoses, and some of these may seem obvious for some of us, even the lay individuals in the community. Again, um, as we've seen them um, driving by, number one being psychiatric and substance abuse, followed by closely infectious disease. Uh, what that means is, it may not be as apparent, but makes sense, is these are skin infections, as many of them um, don't have access to sanitary conditions, uh, running water, oftentimes they don't have access to basic things like socks and shoes, so oftentimes their feet get infected. Also being exposed to the elements, they're very susceptible to lung infections or pneumonias. Um, again, these are very common things we see them for. It, it kind of turns a little bit of the narrative on its head that we oftentimes think that some of these individuals come to the ER and they aren't really sick. Um, but in, in fact, that's actually not true. Uh, we, the actual average age of which our homeless individuals actually die in the community is 51. Uh, and that's actually greater than a third of the expected average age of most of us who are born here in Hawaii, if we're lucky enough to be born here in Hawaii, which is roughly about 72. And now, kind of shifting gears a little bit about what's this program about, we're using this kind of, uh, it's an ideal of approaching what's, what makes up life. Uh, it's 50% the length of life and 50% of quality of life, and that we, we describe that as a health outcome. That's what we're really shooting for. And really here at Queens Medical Center and historically for most tertiary high acute centers that see a bigger proportion of homeless population, we, we want to focus in on uh, the excellence of care because that's what we're really good at. We're, we're, we're a center of excellence in many areas, cardiology, trauma, emergency care, uh, you name it. But what, when we take a step back and take it from a public health perspective, we realize it actually represents about 20% is what the best people in these fields, the brain tank, think about it. Um, and, it's, and it's actually not that that has an impact. It's these other 40% social economical factors. It's housing, access to clean water, transportation. Are they being domestically abused? Do they have unmet behavioral health needs? And that's really what we're trying to focus in on here at the Queens Care Coalition. Now, this is not something I pulled out of thin air. Um, this is really based upon uh, kind of the best evidence provided by Medicare and Medicaid. Millions of dollars of research has gotten into that. As you can probably imagine, the costs are tremendous. There's a place in New Jersey called Camden. Camden, New Jersey. Uh, an individual, a family practitioner named Jeffrey Brenner, uh, in the mid-2000s, found himself in Camden, New Jersey, because he went, he searched actually to see where in the nation had the highest Medicaid utilization. And it ended up being Camden, New Jersey. And what he had found and what he was looking for is he was trying to understand where did that previous graph of social determinants, where can we really start creating real models that address uh, these needs. And he um, created the Camden Coalition. Again, uh, in this middle, focus on care coordination, rapport, and harm reduction. So the way we approach it here at Queens, uh, with the Queens Care Coalition, is that the very core part is identifying this individual. And we have a robust system through our um, electronic medical record to individualize and to find these individuals. And we kind of look at these three big bubbles. Clearly, they're medical. Importantly, they're psychiatric and substance abuse, as you could see from that previous slide, it's, it's the highest reason why they come. Um, and then equally important is the social economical factors. And we try to engage in each of these realms. And then we try to connect, we try to be that coalition that connects it with this very large, robust community support that's being um, actively worked on. Uh, just yesterday, legislative bill, biggest ever in Hawaii history, $500 million dedicated towards uh, housing for the homeless and basically housing that is financially feasible. That was really a target to address uh, the current homeless crisis that we have here in Hawaii. And these are just the big topics of 
what this group of just amazing individuals that I have the privilege to work with are focusing on. You know, the real purpose of what we're trying to do is build an ability for these individuals to have self-independence. Well, just to kind of give a little bit of an example is, you know, we have people that are meeting them and realizing that their need isn't more antibiotics for the cellulitis, is that they find out their need is that they haven't been they haven't had an actual a warm meal in almost three years. They're eating out of trash cans or they're eating cold food, and it's actually someone who actually could receive about $200 in food stamp benefits if he just understood which line to wait in, and he could fill out the form, but he was illiterate. So you understand that some simple things to us represents a very high bar, and this compassionate person, our navigator, that part of Queen's Care Coalition, spent a half day sitting with him in line, filling out the forms, advocating for him, and got him food stamps. And that was probably the most powerful thing beyond any antibiotic, beyond any EKG that we could have done for this individual. And um, the beautiful about that is he had been homeless for 10 years and it actually helped him to get housed um, just by food stability. This is just a quick slide about kind of the size and who are the individuals and some of the community partners involved. I'm very privileged to work with an individual named Kathy Morimoto. She's a, another VP just like Dr. Bruno, um, but she's under a service line that involves social work, social work and case management. Uh, we have an amazing social work manager. Her name's Ashley Seitz. Uh, these are individuals that, you know, have no particular specialty in homeless care, but have had and understanding, just as many of you, when you drive home and you're going through downtown or Chinatown and realize what we're currently up against, and maybe not even those areas, maybe it's Manor or Kaimuki or Hawaii Kai that you see and you realize that this is so, not something that we just can't turn a blind eye anymore to. Um, not to get too deep, but we also have the only in the nation that I'm aware of, of a native population caring for uh, their own native population. So I'm, I'm also very just privileged to work with a group of native Hawaiian navigators that exclusively focus in on the disenfranchised, homeless, or severely mentally ill native Hawaiians that come through our doors and, and they assist with. Some of these groups you might have heard of, some of the groups you might have heard of, um, Institute of Human Services, IHS, on Kuwili Street by uh, downtown Costco, uh, Kalihi Palama and Waikiki Health. These are the big medical centers. One's located, obviously, in Waikiki, but one's located in Kalihi Valley that serve a significant amount of the homeless population. Um, but listed here are things like HPD, EMS, uh, the state Medicaid office. So we're really here working with all the individuals, all the stakeholders. And I just kind of want to leave it last with just another just example to bring it home. So uh, this 58-year-old female, she uh, unfortunately had uh, lost the function of her kidneys. She needed to be connected to a machine, a dialysis machine, every three days. She was afflicted with methamphetamine addiction as well as psychiatric illness. And she was Native Hawaiian, and she lived here, and she was born here in Kaaba on the, on, the, on the west side, on the east side, I'm sorry. And uh, she was living at Ala Park right at Chinatown. And there was a period of time where she started to come in almost every other day, requiring admission into the hospital through the ER. And for me, that was a red flag. I knew she was going to die soon uh, because that's what typically happens. And it was through this team that got to know her, not as a patient, but as a friend, sat with her, actually spent time listening to her, and realized that uh, although there was some psychosis and there was some confusion, after spending enough time, you could kind of see the clarity of some of her thought and realize what she really needed. Um, and that was really just compassion and someone to understand what she was kind of the trauma that she was experiencing every night at Ala Park. Uh, we ended up having her connected with an amazing individual named Sandra and uh, was able to find a friend and a companionship and someone she could trust. Um, and after a period of, I think, roughly almost two dozen admissions over a four-month period, she actually was able to be placed uh, in a foster care home. Uh, she was able to be stabilized on medications. And actually, what was most importantly to me was that she was actually able to be unified with her actual family after she'd been estranged for almost a dozen years. You know, unfortunately, she passed away a year later. Um, but I still think of it as a huge success, and it speaks to what we're trying to do through this program, the Queen's Care Coalition. Uh, because even though she you know, was able to only live another year, I think it was with great quality of life and uh, with great compassion. OK, thank so, you, Dr. Yeah. Chen. At this time, I'd like to call. Let's give him a hand. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to call all the doctors and Greg Payne up to the stage. And we're going to open the floor up to questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and we'll come down. Okay, 
We have a question here. Uh, thank you, doctors and gentlemen. Uh, appreciate uh, you sharing this knowledge with us. Very interesting. Um, and if you could uh, quantify this answer in maybe percentage-wise, I'm talking about infrastructure and uh, uh, things that are available. The EMS service on a typical day, how underutilized or overutilized is it? Also, what would it be under a, number, a um, disaster situation? And what percentage of these resources are being used up by these super users? Share that question. Uh, so the question is, how much, uh, how often does EMS get utilized a day, and um, what's the capacity in the system, and what in times of emergency excess capacity, and then the super utilizers. I'm going to turf to Danny. The first couple I'll hit. Um, we receive about 100,000 uh, EMS calls a year in the state. Uh, clearly, most on Oahu. We run uh, 20 ambulances. More or less, we have some backups. Uh, AMR runs backup for us. Um, the response time in urban Honolulu is very good. So we don't have a shortage of people uh, being able to respond to medical emergencies. Um, about a third of our calls and don't result in a transfer, or uh, they transport to a, an emergency department. So either the patient's not there, or once it got there, it sorted out that it, the patient decided it wasn't an emergency. So, you know, a third of the calls probably don't need to be calls at all, um, but there is dispatch time with that. So day to day, we have enough of assets on the street. Right now in the ledge, we're asking for two more ambulances. Typically, we speak about putting one in Kaka'ako and one in Salt Lake. Uh, Big Island's also asking for one uh, down in um, the Puna area just because of transport times. But generally, we have enough assets in non-emergency times. Your question of if there's a disaster, um, the plane crashes uh, or, you know, the fire at Marco Polo definitely puts a strain on the system. Um, the reserve capacity, we're fortunate in that um, in the state we have uh, a number of uh, emergency vehicles that are essentially buses that you could transport uh, multiple patients. We don't use those day to day, but they're in storage. Um, the disasters I worry about are the ones like going on in Kauai right now, where there was a geographic issue on how would you get um, from the North Shore to a hospital. And so we pulled a helicopter from uh, the Big Island to do that. So uh, situations like that cut off if we had another big hurricane, I definitely uh, get worried about that. And then, Dan, you want to talk about how the super utilizers uh, use EMS? Yeah, so about every fourth visit to the ER by super utilizers is either by EMS or by HPD, as many of them sometimes have to come in by the police. It's about 10 per day is a rough estimate of how much utilization. It's about three to 4,000 per year. Yeah, and at Queens, we see about 70 ambulances a day between the two facilities, just a rough number. Okay, we have a question there. Oh. Thank you. I, I'm a pediatrician in West Oahu, and I recently had one of my patients at Queens West where a nurse practitioner saw the patient, and I guess um, the x-ray was um, signed off by the attending emergency doctor. However, it was a wrong interpretation, and so the next day, um, you know, so anyway, my question is, are there x-rays that 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 only certain ones get read by a radiologist only if they feel it's an emergency otherwise if people feel confident they do not so i can answer that one so the way it works is we have um after hours no radiologist reading x-rays so generally monday through friday during regular hours there's a radiologist part day saturday and sunday but certainly overnight the radiologist reads those x-rays and they're reviewed the next morning by the radiologist. Um, the radiologists are reading through um, virtual radiology, CT scans, MRIs, and advanced imaging. So in that case, we have a safety net built in, and we look at all the discrepancies, and we make appropriate calls the next day as, as needed to take care of the patient. So the radiologist from Queens did call me the next morning, and the child was immediately sent to Kapiolani. But who could we speak to, to just so that this won't happen again? You can talk to me, and we'll All try right. and figure out a better system. But uh, you know, there, there's uh, 
Yeah, I, the, I this, this that. is pretty typical for all emergency departments across the nation. That we're no different. Uh, there just aren't radiologists reading x-rays 24-7. Right. I had one more question. As a pediatrician, we remove sutures. And, and because we're PMPM, I, I understand that we may not be able to charge, and some, some of these kid, kiddos take about one to two hours to remove sutures. So are we doing this for free, or can we refer them back to the ER for removal? Well, I, you know, preferably they would go back to a more appropriate place for care, mm -hmm. rather because it's not an emergency, right? And the ER is already overcrowded and undersized. Right, right. So it's really where can they get the most appropriate care yeah. for the right reason. And I, it right may time. not be a question for you, but maybe more for the insurance companies. Right. And just to add on that, Tracy, one of the things that's uh, bizarre is if you send them back to the ER, I can charge for it. I'm, so just to, again, the, this, uh, you know, payment per member, uh, payment per PMPM is there are some uh, incentives that are misaligned in that we can get paid for them, but we're overcrowded. You can't get paid for taking it out. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Okay, there's one there. Sure, go ahead. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I have a question since I live in town. Um, if there was an ambulance, which hospital would they normally take an individual? And is there like a certain app that you recommend um, if I'm alone and such that has all my doctor's information, medication, and so forth mm -hmm. that might be appropriate for you folks to see if I'm, you know, if there's somebody, an acquaintance that doesn't really know me that might be in the ambulance itself as well. So how does that work? The app issue, I'm going to turn to the, somebody who's more techie than me, but uh, it's interesting that transportation guidelines for Oahu, there's pretty specific rules about who goes where. Uh, town, it's essentially patient preference, and town is very loosely defined from essentially Wailupe to School Street. Uh, so the point being is that um, if you're picked up in town and your physicians are at Queens, the best move is say, please take me to Queens. Uh, if your physicians are at HPH, probably best to say go to HPH. There are overruling things is we get all trauma. Um, you know, uh, a patient in cardiac arrest goes to the, the closest facility. But if you have a preference and you live in very loosely stated town, like if you're a Kaiser patient, uh, they will take you to Kaiser as long as the medic feels it's safe to take you there. As far as uh, health apps, you guys have any comments? Well, a quick one would be if you're if you do go to Queens, you should have my chart downloaded and installed because it's a really great application. Um, uh, it's uh, free to use and it actually I, I use it for my physician again it's called my chart and it's a great way to actually both communicate with your primary care provider without having to actually schedule an appointment but something that we can also tap into at times another thing is we're, we're living through the pain of the electronic health record uh, being implemented over the last decade one of the really nice things in Hawaii is HPH Kaiser and Queens have share the same uh, record. We don't have we have different systems, but we have access. So if you're a Straub patient and you end up in the Queens Emergency Department, I can see all of your records at Straub and reciprocally. So we're slowly getting better. It's not perfect, um, but at least those three systems we all can see the records at the other hospital. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you for the talk. It was very enlightening. I noticed that during the lecture you spoke of a psych psychiatric emergencies. I was wondering if there was any uh, unique unique uh, admission or a unique uh, protocol they go through as opposed to other types of emergencies. I can, I can address that one. So at, um, at Punchbowl we have a six bed emergency psychiatric unit which is locked. And so they would, depending on what the nature of their um, medical problems were and psychiatric illness was, they, they would potentially go into that unit. Um, it all depends on what's best for the patient and uh, those around them. And so at Punchbowl, we have that. At West, there's a, a room available for the psychiatric patient as well. And um, other hospitals have capability as well. So most emergency departments have some sort of a built-in place or area and processes behind that to take care of the psychiatric patient, which is sort of a special need. We also have areas to take care of the pediatric patient, the trauma patient, kind of designated rooms for those types of purposes to help uh, improve the care, depending on what the need is. Okay. 
Other questions? Raise your hand. Oh, go ahead. Hi, I have a question in terms of neighbor islands, air transport, or um, I guess whatever you call helicopters or air airplane type of uh, transport. How much does that run normally, and is that covered by insurance? It's a great, great question. And uh, if you Google that in New York Times, you'll see it's an issue we struggle with nationally. The air ambulances are, um, if you remember, when uh, air traffic was deregulated. Uh, that includes all of the, the air ambulances. So the, we regulate pretty stringently the ground ambulance services. Like you can't start a ground ambulance service here. You have to go through the CON process just like any other healthcare. But nationally, um, inter-facility transport, helicopter transports, most of those are owned by private firms. And in fact, the Hawaii ones right now are owned by KKR. I don't know if that's a big Silicon Valley uh, uh, private equity firm and uh, private equity firms are in business to make money. Um, and so if you have commercial insurance, uh, you'll have a copay. Uh, if you have no insurance, you will get a very large bill from the uh, uh, air traffic, I mean, sorry, the air companies in the you know, twenty to $100,000 range. And if you're interested in it, Google it. Uh, it's, a, it's a national issue, uh, but it's an unregulated industry with respect to cost. We're fortunate here. Um, we have two companies um, who both want to be in the state, and they, they actually both sell insurance plans that are pretty cheap. If you live on the neighbor islands, they're about 60 bucks, and they cover the copays. If you have a government plan, uh, it's completely covered. Um, so it's really like most health care. If you have good insurance or if you have a federally covered plan, um, the copay is uh, for, the for the government ones, they, there is essentially no copay. But it's a complicated issue, and there have been people who have gotten big bills. Lisa, there's a question in front right here. Oh, okay. Uh, would you please discuss the. Um, uh, effect of an advanced directive and the reason I ask that well, in terms of priority and uh, the care you get and the reason I ask that is I had the opportunity to take my uncle to the an ER visit not at Queens and uh, the con what happened was he had an overnight change in his uh, mental capacity and the uh, his primary you know thought maybe it was a bladder infection so you know, we, he said, go directly to the ER, get tested for that, uh, you know, as a first thing. And so we, I brought him in, and the physician sat me down. And he says, it's illegal for me to help him at all. And I'm like, oh wow. So, um, but we got it cleared up by the doctor calling the primary, and uh, you know, then they just did the test there, and that that's all we were there for. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that, uh, that's a good question, and I think we're seeing more and more of those similar situations that you unfortunately went through with your family members. Um, so uh, what he was asking was uh, about the advanced directive, or physician order for life-sustaining treatment, kind of describing uh, for people that are very ill, critically ill, um, possible a terminal uh, cancer, terminal heart failure, um, terminal like lung disease, uh, what you want for your end of life. Um, or if it is near your end of life, what kind, how invasive treatments you want. If you want surgery, central lines, intubations, hooked up on life support. Um, so these are all difficult discussions to have in the emergency department. You know, it, usually when you come to the emergency department, you or your family member are very sick, distressed, and it's kind of hard to make those decisions and have those discussions. So having those discussions with your family members in advance of what they would want in certain situations is the way to go. Um, it's a hard discussion to have. I know my father just got diagnosed with Parkinson's, my mother just had cancer last year. Having those discussions is kind of a, it's a difficult discussion to have, uh, but it's a really important discussion to have, and it's better to have it in advance rather than waiting when, into when you get into the emergency department. Now, for, for your father's case, it sounds like he already had, you had already had that discussion, um, kind of had a goal of care um, did you bring in, sometimes there's a piece of paper, the physician order for life sustaining treatment. Did you bring that in as well? It was already on uh, the hospital system. Right, okay. And, so, yeah. And we were only going for a test for a bladder infection. It was not 
going to die at that point. <laughs> was, was he in hospice? Was it a hospice care? I don't know why the physician... Oh, no, no, he wasn't even in hospice. I don't know why anybody would say it's illegal or not appropriate. I mean, the <laughs> ER is there for people to get cared for, yeah. and even if you're in hospice or you have a pulse, it doesn't mean you don't want to be taken care of and treated for, you know, you just have some guidelines around what that means. And so I, I don't know what happened there. It doesn't quite make sense. But we wouldn't I hopefully ever say that at Queens. I mean, you can... Okay, yeah. yeah. Because I basically said what you said, and um, at least we were able to clear it up when one yeah. doctor talked to another yeah, I mean, and, and we got to but, test I mean, what, I don't quite understand why somebody would say that. Yeah. <clears throat> I would just say that um, the, the advanced directive is really specific about... Um, the end of life, how far are you going to go with the end of life care and um, you know we automatically are trying to work out what's going on when someone comes in that would be all the diagnostic testing um, and we do everything we can up to the point that that document tells us to stop that's the way we always approach it um, and that's why it's not really nice to have it there because once it gets to that point it's a very difficult decision just another thing to add, just for yours, I think this is relevant to everybody, is that Hawaii is uh, one of just a handful of states that actually have the, that green paper is the POLST, Physician Order of Life Sustaining Treatment. Most people understand that if you're about to die, do you want chest compressions or do you want a breathing tube? And that's the standard living will that most of us, I think, know about. Um, but this form that your, your brother had is a more of a sophisticated way to kind of take it to a deeper level of how invasive do you want a physician in the ER to care for your loved one? And because it's trying to be a little bit more detailed, sometimes there can be some confusion. Uh, but just to highlight again what Dr. Clemmer mentioned, at any time, especially if it's a green form, it really can be revoked. It's, it's not a law binding actual piece of paper. It's actually just a piece of paper that's really meant to guide the physician. There's no law related to that. There's no fines. There's nothing really binding to it, it's just meant to help to guide. So sometimes there can be confusion even within the healthcare provider, um, but again, that, that's kind of the basis. It can be changed really at any time. That's Versus the living will, it actually is a formal document. It has to be signed by a lawyer, those kind of things. This is a little bit different. Okay, other questions? Uh, in regards to the new uh, death with dignity law that was just passed, mm. uh, speaking of that, um, what uh, issues or uh, problems does the ER department or an ER doctor uh, anticipate having unique uh, problems with, with uh, implementing that? My guess is we're going to... Whoa, sorry about that. We're going to have very little role as far as initiating that. We've actually had uh, some internal discussion about this. I think it, uh, it's new enough that we're not sure exactly how it's going to impact, uh, especially what we do, like these guys were saying. So much of it is trying to figure out what's going on. Someone sick shows up. And so kind of the end of life uh, issues, you know, it, it's probably mostly outside the emergency department. Um, and if the law is so new, and honestly, internally in the House of Medicine, we've been debating mm -hmm. what does it mean, because some hospitals may opt out, honestly, as far as hospital policy-wise. So it's, it's, it's you know, like, like you said, it just came out, and we're going to see what happens. I don't know if you guys have. Sure. I think there's a, you know, just on that same line, there's a lot of states that have these orders for life-sustaining treatment, and there's very few that actually have a protocol in place to allow physician-assisted death to occur, like I think Oregon, right, and I'm, I'm not sure which other states, but the, we're one of the first on that, maybe there's three or four. But the, the other states have like a MOLST, they call it Medical Order for life sustaining Treatment, or POLST, and if you look it up online, you can see what that form has and, and identify uh, if that's something that would work for you. We'd highly recommend you at least think about that, anybody who's getting old in life, even I have one, I'm 52, I think it's important to know for my loved ones what I would want to have done if I were to be injured badly or something of that nature. And I don't, you know, in, in general about dying, you know, in the old days they built buildings that would allow a stretcher uh, or a coffin to go up and down the stairway because people died in the at home, right? And, and a lot of that cost of care, that 35 to 40 percent of the care of the cost of care occurs at the time of death in the last 30 days. 
And really the best place to die is not in the hospital, it's at home with your family and your loved ones, but with a team that helps guide you through that. So uh, Queens has a wonderful pain and palliative care program and they have great people on board. So if you do have a loved one who's ill and has a terminal illness and they're thinking about end of life issues, ask to have a consult with that pain and palliative care team. And they're also able to do, I think, outpatient care too. You don't have to be hospitalized. Okay, let's give a great big round of applause for our speakers this evening. Dr. Bruno, Dr. Clemmer, Dr. Dubé, Greg Payne, and Dr. Chang. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge our volunteers this evening. One is Laura, who's kind of surreptitiously trying to get out of the door right there. And Lon, let's give them a big hand for their help this evening. I also want to thank the emergency department staff who is out there taking your vitals and giving you information and made the copies for the PowerPoint for you this evening. Our next Speaking of Health lecture right here at Queen's Punchbowl is called Advancements in Stroke Management. It's going to feature Dr. Ronnie Salem, who is a neurohospitalist and vascular neurologist here at Queen's. You're going to find out the latest in stroke prevention and treatment, also risk factors, how to recognize a stroke, common and uncommon causes of stroke, new treatment strategies for stroke, a new approach to stroke prevention, and research that may change stroke treatment in the future. That is Wednesday, May 30th, 2018. For those when it's recorded, I want to make sure it's 2018. Uh, it's 6 to 7 right here at QCC. If you are going to register, you can call 691-7117 or go online to queensmedicalcenter.org slash health lectures. I want to thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, make sure you get your parking tickets validated out with Erin and drive safe because you don't want to see these people tonight or the emergency department. You don't want to witness it tonight. So thank you for coming.